คครับจังโอ้ยวันโอ้ยบูดาเฮ้ยเฮ้ยเอสขอบคุณขอบคุณที่มาฟังและฟังฉันเดวิดเมซันฉันจากดีโทรตมิชิแกนและฉันอยู่ในเกาหลีมาตั้งแต่ปี1982อันฟาสินาทิดบ่ายคอเรียนบูดิสม์ทุกวันวันนี้ท็อปิกนี้เป็นเรื่องที่เป็นประเด็นสำคัญเกี่ยวกับบางช่วงเวลาที่ต้องเสียชีวิตของคอเรียนบูดิสม์และแบบไหนที่ชีนีสบูดิสม์เกิดคอเรียนบูดิสม์ไงเขาเกิดคอเรียนด้วยหนึ่งในผู้นำที่ต้องเสียชีวิตของคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่าคอเรียนบูดิสม์ที่เรียกว่า Uh, there are other monks like Won Hyo and Wee Sang, who I'm going to talk about next time, <laughs> in the next lecture, next month, who are much more famous and well-known and celebrated by the public. Him, not so much, and uh, really should be. I, I think you will, you will see by this presentation, he was one generation earlier than them. He was the leading master before they became prominent in the late 600s. He's the man of the early 600s, the early 7th century. And there you have his name in the various different languages. Okay. Hard to say how this works. Ah, here we go. Ah, there we go. In your life, you're born in 590. 590. B Buddhism was just accepted in the Shilla Kingdom in 527. You may know when King Bubhung made himself the first king of the uh, Shilla Dynasty and adopted Buddhism after it had been strictly illegal for a couple hundred years and such. And then he was born 590, so quite a bit after that, after Buddhism was getting established, but was still very primitive and very undeveloped. Something he was actually born on Buddha's birthday. Wow, <laughs> as a good sign. And by 12 years old, everybody said he was a genius and already uh, could read and write as well as people who had studied who were already 20 years old or so. He was one of those kind of prodigies. Ah, there we go. Uh, this is what. The peninsula looked like when he was there. The Shilla kingdom started in just the Gyeongsang provinces there, just in the southeast, but had grown big and strong and huge, like under King Jinpyeong, had really expanded its power. So there was a sense of a bigger nation, a nation with more territory and needing to establish a better Buddhism. And then along comes Jajang. To fulfill that role. Okay, uh, his parents died and he then uh, in great sorrow for his parents uh, renounced the world, donated his family estate as a Buddhist temple, retreated to the mountains, um, uh, practiced the intensive early kinds of meditation about death and decay and destruction. He lived in a hut with brambles around him so that he would sit and meditate. And if he, fought, if he fell asleep and fell over, he'd be into the thorns, the brambles, and wake, it, wake him up to keep him meditating. That kind of strict, heavy practice which still some monks do today. Uh, he was called because of his, his education, his reputation as a great guy and a genius. The king kept calling him again and again to be a minister, to come to the palace and serve, which most people would want to do. That's how you get rich. That's how you, you gain power. But he refused. He'd right, be a Buddhist monk. Finally, the king ordered him and said, you know, you could be executed if you don't obey the king. Well, cut off your head and he said I'd rather die keeping the precepts the Buddhist precepts as a monk for one more day than to live a hundred years breaking the precepts uh, like being a government ministers so then the king said okay this guy's a Buddhist monk <laughs> I guess there's just no way to stop that and uh, allowed him to become and supposedly a heavenly being giving him the precepts 
uh, because there was, see, there was no qualified person, perhaps, to really give him the precepts. So this idea that a heavenly being appeared and did so. Uh, he lamented that Korea was remote and primitive, uh, not enough Buddhist knowledge, not much organization back then in any of the three kingdoms, actually not much. And he got permission to leave Shilla and to seek advanced Buddhist education in Tang Dynasty China, to go to where the real Buddhism was. You know, Buddhism was imported to China about 100 AD from India, and they spent a few hundred years just trying to translate all these scriptures, all the sutras and stuff from uh, Sanskrit and other Indian languages translated into Chinese characters. It was a tremendous task. It took hundreds of years, and then when they they got it all translated, they really didn't like what they found. <laughs> the Chinese, they had a different way of thinking, so they started developing Chinese Buddhism around 500 AD, taking off the original Indian Buddhism, but making it Chinese style, really a whole different mood, a different setting, a different meaning of enlightenment and nirvana and such. Uh, so Chinese Buddhism around 500 AD, and so this is uh, by uh, uh, 636, uh, Chinese Buddhism is really flourishing. Let's say between 500 to 700 is really the greatest developments of Chinese style Buddhism and the greatest masters in several different schools. The Zen school and then several different doctrine schools. The greatest masters in China were teaching and preaching uh, great geniuses, making a whole new style of Buddhism that today we call Northeast Asian Mahayana Buddhism creating that. So he wanted to go there to get the real stuff. It's just like a Korean today, let's say, who wants to go to an Ivy League university, wants to go to Harvard or MIT to get the latest and the best and the highest kind of teachings. But then in these days, understand, this was really dangerous. Uh, getting from Korea to China was not easy at all. Many people died in the attempt. The ships were bad quality and getting across the Yellow Sea was treacherous. And if you tried to go overland through the mountains, it was full of tigers and bandits and Manchurian tribes that would uh, arrest you. Uh, and uh, whatever, uh, it, it was really very difficult. Somebody to get to China, get the teachings, and then come back and make it back to the Shilla kingdom alive was really very rare. Only a few figures ever did it. And Jia Zhang, uh, before Jia Zhang, there was Master Wen Guang who did it. He was maybe the first. And then uh, he, Jia Zhang is next generation. Uh, he's either the second or the third who actually accomplished that to go there and get back alive. So they went to Wu Taishan. Wu Taishan is still a major tourism center in China, a major Buddhist center. It used to, it's one big mountain complex, five mountains in a circle, and there used to be 220 Buddhist temples there. And uh, uh, today there's uh, 40 or 45 or something that are still operating and lots of tourism sites. It's one of the major Buddhism centers of the world, China's Wu Taishan. It's in North China, it's the northmost Buddhist mountain, and it's like directly west of Beijing, a few hundred miles. Okay, I've been there twice. It is amazing, Wu Taishan. Five great mountains in a circle, 3,000 meters high at the summit, the highest mountains of North China, and uh, dedicated to Munsu Bosa. That's what Koreans say, Munsu Bosa uh, in uh, Manjushri for the Chinese, Wenshu for Chinese, or Manjushri for Sanskrit, uh, whatever, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. And in my lecture, I'll call him Munzu Bosal, the, the Korean term. Munzu, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, the Buddha who exemplifies the whole idea of wisdom in contrast to the Bodhisattva of compassion, the Bodhisattva of benevolent action, the Bodhisattva of salvation, the other major ones. This is wisdom. And his home is there. That's his home uh, in China where he lives and where people do pilgrimage to 
uh, worship and learn wisdom traditions. Okay. Uh, images of, uh, these are Chinese images of the Bodhisattva of wisdom and on his characteristic mount, the Heite. Stop that. This thing is kind of worn out. Ah, these are the, the, uh, the big Dagoba, the great Dagoba of the Bodhisattva of Wisdom and the major temples of Wu Taishan today. Great place to visit if you can. Come on. Yeah. All right. Now, he went there and he had, he worshiped and prayed and he studied. He was there a couple of years and he had revelatory mystical visions of Munsu Bosal. He saw the Bodhisattva and talked to him, which many other pilgrims also did over the centuries at this place. And he met the dragon king of the Taihei Pond, which is a pond at the center of the five mountains down in the valley. Uh, he talked to the dragon there. <laughs> All right. And he was at Ville advised to build a nine-story pagoda and to find mountains similar to this in Korea, mountains that look like these mountains, this Wu Taishan. Find that in Korea. It's also in your country. Okay. And given precious gifts, mainly holy relics of Sakyamuni Buddha, supposedly these items from the actual Sakyamuni Buddha, which had come from India and were in, enshrined here. And he was given these as gifts supposedly, to bring back to Korea home. Okay, he then studied. He went for a few years of study in the capital of the Tang Dynasty, where other Koreans later studied Chang'an, the greatest city in the world at this time. In the early 600s, as Rome had collapsed and Byzantium was still on the upswing, but Chang'an had two million human beings in one city, uh, by far the biggest city in the world at that time, and the most luxurious and cosmopolitan, and the most stuff happening, and the greatest, several different schools of the greatest Buddhist masters of, of the age teaching right there. So it was a real paradise for a student. He didn't live in luxury in a city temple like most visiting monks would and such, but he built built his own hut in the mountains outside and came into the city for study. He was a really frugal and ascetic person, refusing any luxury. He studied these three schools, three key schools of Buddhism. Uh, the last one, the Avatamsaka, later becomes uh, a great school in Korea, but he didn't introduce it. The next generation master, Wisang, introduced it, not him. But he studied those. And especially the Vinaya school, notice Vinaya, that's the rules for the monks, how the monks should live. He studied that as a formal school of Buddhism. And so favored by the emperor, uh, he's a brilliant student and uh, very uh, well received as a Korean in the Tang dynasty. And the emperor gave him gifts when he went back to Korea. He came back to Korea and there was a new king, in fact, a queen, Queen Sunduk, Sunduk Yawang, very, uh, f very famous in Korea. The only, in classical traditional times, the only truly great woman that ever ruled the country. Her, she had no husband. Her father, after her father didn't have a son, and after much deliberations about nephews and such, finally appointed her because she really seemed to have ability and be tough. And she became queen for 15 years. And she was a great queen. She was strong. She strengthened the nation, built it, expanded it further, and very much promoted Buddhism. So she's remembered as a great hero. She appointed another woman to follow her. For she ruled for seven years and was weaker. And then after that, we never had a real female ruler in this country until eight years ago, they uh, seven years ago, they elected Pak gun the dictator's daughter, as president. That was the first female leader in 
1,400 years, the first real female leader. And she was a total failure, so that's unfortunate. But she was really successful. And by the way, on your 50,001 bill, you got a, you got a woman there, the perfect housewife of the Joseon dynasty. It's on the 50,001. The young women of Korea did not want her on the money at all as the perfect housewife, perfect mother. They wanted her on the money. Her, Queen Sunduk, the young women of Korea, they went, uh, there was a, a woman with a job, a woman that ran the country. Uh, so, so she was queen when Jia Zhang returned, and she was very powerful, and she received Jia Zhang very well and appointed him and said, okay, you're going to be the main man of Korean Buddhism in my kingdom because of what you learned in China. Okay. She gave him authority. She gave him power to establish new temples, consecrate the territory, make the territory sacred of the new Shilla Kingdom, the expanded areas of Shilla Kingdom, the new conquered places. She gave him that authority, and that means giving him money, giving him soldiers for protection, giving him you know, hundreds of construction workers uh, under him, really quite a big government project to do these things, and appointed him as the supreme Buddhist overseer. Uh, later, they had the term Guksa, national master, but this is hundreds of years before that became a reality. We'll talk about that later in my third lecture for this series. Um, such, but before that, as simply supreme Buddhist overseer. They'd never had this before, but one guy appointed as, you are the top monk of the country. And he established a royal office of Buddhism and structure and discipline. You understand what this means. Uh, before this, see, B Buddhism was kind of chaotic, unorganized. Pretty much anybody could say they were a Buddhist monk. You know, you, you just put on a robe and shave your head and you say, hey, I'm a Buddhist monk. And who can say that you're not? And you can say, my house is a Buddhist temple. And every country in the world deals with these kind of issues even right now today because Buddhist temples didn't pay tax. And if you were a Buddhist monk, you didn't have to do uh, labor, uh, forced labor required of all citizens, national duty or such, or pay tax. And that's still true today in many countries. Churches don't pay tax. Church ministers don't pay tax, whatever. And so it's really important who is really a church and who isn't. It's really easy to fake it, right? You just say, my house is a church. My house is a Buddhist temple. Ha <laughs> ha, I don't have to pay any tax. Thank you. Uh, but uh, that's really important then for governments to control control that to make laws and say what is a church, what is a temple, and what is not, and to exclude that, and who is a monk, and who isn't really a monk. Jajan got the power, finally, to establish this within Korea. Such. He founded the Yuljung, Vinaya school, strict regulations for registering temples, practicing Buddhist monasticism, exams for becoming a monk. If you want to be a Buddhist monk, you had to pass exam, and actually every three years you had to take the exam again, just to see if you had not forgotten, or if you had new knowledge in there. You had to take an exam every three years. If you failed the exam, take off the robe, go back to work, get a job. <laughs> you know, but only if you could pass the exams. So making an organized system, which still comes down to us today, it's like that now, that's why monks go to Dongguk University to study, right? And uh, Chinese style robes and headgears. Therefore, he's known as Jajang Yilsa. Yilsa means precept master, Vinaya master. He's the only one. We have many monks named Desa, which means great master, or even Josa, founding master, founded a kind, some school of Buddhism. He's the only one known as Yulsa in Korean history. It's exclusive title to him, and he remains the, the founder of Korean Buddhist organization, the organizing of it. Important stuff. Now, the other thing he did that's really uh, a legacy that comes down right to today, the Jokmil Bogung Temples. Please learn that vocabulary. Repeat after me, please. Jokmil Bogung. 
Chokmil Bogum. Chokmil Bogum. All right, all right, all right. This means Jokmul means silent nirvana, nirvana or sublime. It means like a Buddha who's already passed beyond. So silent nirvana, not speaking anymore. And then Bogum, treasure palace, a shrine higher even than a, a palace hall, higher than the main hall of a temple that contains a Buddha. Bogum is the highest possible status that a building can have, that a, a building, there are many different terms for buildings in Korea, like Gok and Jun and such, I guess, but Bogum is the highest uh, treasure palace. So a Jokmul Bogum temple, that means a temple that contains a Jokmul Bogum building, and it means a shrine containing Sarya of Sakyamuni Buddha. The actual remains after Sakyamuni Buddha had a funeral, you know, cremation. They burned his body. And after that, 3,000 relics were found in his ashes. 3,000 crystal relics. Most monks, when they die, there's just a few of those crystal relics. It's actually crystallized calcium from uh, in your bones from the fire, uh, little calcium crystals. Most monks leave a few of them. The great master Songchul in the 20th century died in 1992, and it is said that in his ashes they found 108, exactly the Buddhist number, 108 Sarya crystals. Well, the Buddha himself, left 3,000 of them <laughs> as really a, a superhero guy. And uh, those were distributed by Emperor Ashoka all over the kingdom of India and down to Sri Lanka and up into Afghanistan, distributed all over to make holy Buddhist places. And some of them came across the Silk Road to China, and some of them apparently were acquired by Jajang and given to him there at China's Wu Tejan Mountain supposedly. He brought them and he established these temples with these relics of actual pieces of Sakyamuni Buddha's body, implanted them in Korea to make holy places, holy land. Okay. Now, the Sarya are in stone pagodas, Buddha reliquary monument, in different ways, earthen mound in two cases, buried into the earth. He did various different things with them. Uh, it includes a shrine building that offers that. There are today in Korea, there's about two dozen temples that claim to have Jokmul Bogung shrines, that claim to have relics of Sakyamuni, about two dozen. But these established by Jajang are the original six and thought to be the, the original and the most authentic that we think. One of them is even uh, Jogesa Temple downtown Seoul here has one relic of Buddha that came from Sri Lanka and seems to be really authentic. Anyway, uh, these are the original. This thing is not working. Ah, okay. The sacred and scenic mountains, all the five extant ones. Two were down in valleys, one mid altitude, two up near peaks. A variety of places that he put them. The vanished one is under the central pillar of Huang Yongsa, the nine story pagoda, which was destroyed by the Mongols. Uh, in the 1200s, and the Sarya relics disappeared, never found. Uh, that it remains as just a ruins of stones in an empty field in Kyungju. They keep talking about rebuilding it, but God only knows if they'll ever get enough money. This is what they, the temple looked like before uh, the greatest temple of the Shilly Kingdom, right in the middle of Kyungju City, back when Kyungju City was nearly a million people in that valley, and this was right in the middle of it. Today, that's what it looks like on the bottom, just ruins. We keep talking about rebuilding it. Take, it's going to take a whole lot of money to try to rebuild it. We don't know. Now, uh, these are the status right now of status of the different areas, again, it's uh, diversity. Diversity of the uh, situation. Now, Master Jajan's first trip north into Gangwangdo, the newly conquered area of Shilla, where they had taken this away from the Goguryeo Kingdom. And it's along the Bay Gang, 
You know something about the Bay Judea, it's the main mountain line of Korea. And actually, President Lee Myung Bak, ten years ago, uh, or nine years ago, maybe, appointed me ambassador of the Bay Judea. <laughs> so that's a real thing. Uh, yes, and uh, this is the main mountains of Korea, and you can go hiking on them today. It's that, that line that runs all through Korea, North Korea, South Korea, the United Ridge Line of Korea, and the North Korean area is mostly off limits to us, but it seems my way to there's a lot of hiking along the South Korea, part of that 735 kilometers of continuous hiking trail. A great adventure. And Jajang made his temples along this line of mountains on either side of the following that line. Okay. Uh, he gave Buddhist names to these mountains. These are the names of these mountains still today as national parks, provincial parks, and those are Buddhist names. They mean something in Buddhism. Jajang gave those names. Go up these greatest mountains, uh, giving them these Buddhist style names, which they still have. Okay, this is the kind of the line where you get it, and you see I put in numbers, blue numbers. G is Gyeongju, the capital of Shilla, then, and these are one, two, three, four, five, where you get it. G. Gyeongju, that was number one, the first place he did. But then he went up there, two, three, four, and then five down here, and finally six, again, up north. Made these very special temples. <laughs> Odessa, National Park, and this is nearby where they held the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. So it became kind of internationally famous. We were going here, a beautiful place. Uh, here, these kind of peaks and lovely. And this is what he found that is similar to China's Wu Taishan. Wu he got to these mountains in Korea and he looked around and said, Yeah, yeah, right. Five mountains in a circle and it looks like the Chinese mountain. They're only about half as high as the Chinese mountain, but it looks similar to him. So he said, This is the place. And he established this. Wogosa, the Moon Vitality Temple, uh, still today one of the most important temples in Korea, dedicated to the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. 643, unfortunately destroyed in the Korean War and had to be reconstructed. So there it is. In this temple, not destroyed by the Korean War, that pagoda and the statue, that's a statue of the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Moons of Bolsa, uh, Wenju, whatever, uh, and the uh, pagoda that he, the, the statue was worshipping in front of the pagoda that was built about a thousand years ago and one of Korea's greatest national treasure stone works of Buddhism. And it was very much featured from the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics on television a lot. Temple. Up above the temple, way up on the mountain, halfway up the mountain, to the peak is this, the actual Jokbyul Bogum Shrine, the silent Nirvana treasure palace, and behind it is an earthen mound containing the relic of Sakyamuni Buddha. Jaja planted the relic right into the mountain and covered it up and said to make the mountain itself like a pagoda containing a relic of Buddha, the entire mountain, gigantic. The, uh, the uh, ninth highest peak in the nation, as that, and becoming itself a pagoda, with Buddha Mountain that a worshipable place by this relic planted behind this shrine. That's where the relic is planted in that mound, with that little stone marker to mark it as one of the holiest places of Korean Buddhism, as an authentic relic of Sadia, of Sakyamuni Buddha, planted in this place. So then Jatang did this to make this mountain holy shrine, which is 
still is, for pilgrims, right below that area, San Juan Sa, the other kind of upper temple, Prokwojongsa, very famous temple. This one was not destroyed in the Korean War due to a certain by its abbot, a very excellent thing, and uh, remains very authentic in a place of great treasures. And this, uh, the princes founded this for the Bodhisattva wisdom. Later, much later, in the Joseon dynasty, King Sejo visited here. The king of the Joseon dynasty visited this place, and he met the Bodhisattva wisdom. At least he said so. This is in around 1500 AD, not that long ago, in fairly modern times. He, the king reported that he talked to the Bodhisattva wisdom who was appearing as a young boy in the form of a young boy, for the of purity and innocence. Kind of meaning as though the king of Korea authorized that wooden statue to be carved of the Bodhisattva wisdom appearing as a 10 year old boy and had it gilded in gold and it's still there at that temple as a old relic. Okay, then, going up, uh, oh yeah, I wasted that. Okay, yeah, now, one of the most spectacular places in Korea, in the Sorakzan Mountains, deep high, way up in the mountains. Jajang came way up here. This is the 12 or 1300 meters elevation. It's near the highest peak on mainland South Korea, 1,700 meters. It's just below that, about 1,300 meters. Jaja came up here, and right there you see a, a plaza platform, and he built a pagoda and put the Buddha's relic in there. Now, how did he even find this place in 640 AD? There was no civilization nearby, like the nearest fishing village was in a two-day two walk from this point right here, and it's climbing way up in the mountains, and the mountains are filled with tigers back then, the high mountains, so why the heck did he go way up here and think there was any advantage to putting a holy relic? Who did he think was ever gonna climb up here and visit that? No, I don't know, there doesn't seem any record as to his decision making or whatever, but he came up here, and it's a spectacular place, as you can see. That's the actual hermitage below the pagoda. Today, the modern hermitage. It's great. They do a temple stay. You can you can stay overnight there and worship at that pagoda at dawn. And it is fabulous, a fantastic experience. One of the most amazing places to go in Korea. Dagan discovered this in 644 AD. That's the pagoda itself. Children coming to worship. Spectacular thing to visit. It's amazing. Something so ancient and still in such authentic, good condition. Think of the weather, the weather up there, in the very high in the Sark Mountains, the winter. The summer sun, the winds, and whatever. That's still sad. It's 44. Never has fallen over damaged. Then all he came down into the deep valleys of what is now the South Han River, the South Han River that runs to, to become the Han River here in Seoul, uh, in there, kind of halfway from the Beki Dayan towards Seoul, or a little less than halfway near what is now the Chiasan National Park. He came here to a spectacular valley gorge and planted his next one, is, uh, number four planted in these, uh, the mound behind this shrine, Babunsa, um, and has a reliquary there of a great master monk who served there later. Uh, the Saudi of Buddha is in that tomb mound behind there. That is, again, a great pilgrimage place of the Buddha. And there you go, there's the Jokmil Bogum building where people do the worshiping. Okay. Now the fifth one he established is what is today one of the greatest Buddhist temples in Korea. So I made a list of the top six. You just can't pick one out of them to say it's the best, but there's like a top six temples of Korean Buddhism. They're on my website. Please check. There's also the top 21 list and the top 108 list. Uh, uh, check that out. But certainly, Tongoza is one of the very greatest, one of the top six, and it's 
designated this is the national treasure of Korea, and uh, this this uh, temple is really one of the Vatican, one of the, the, the capital centers of Korean Buddhism, where the greatest master serve, the greatest uh, assemblies and gatherings are held. And it propo as it proposes the UNESCO World Heritage Site, it is a UNESCO. I'm out of date here. It is, as of one year ago, it became a UNESCO World Cultural. It's like seven great mountain Buddhist temples were designated, and this is one of them. Yay! Victory for Korea. That slide. So this is where they are again. And then, now we're down here on the GTCMG and then number five. Both into uh, north of Busan City. This is where this is. This mountain is at a vulture peak where Buddha preached the Lotus Sutra. That's an actual mountain in the Himalaya mountain chain in Nepal. But then this mountain was given that name. Notice the very flat platform on the peak, the flat peak. So it's considered like a, you can imagine a giant Buddha spirit sitting on that peak lecturing. And from Gosa, I'll build that. Well, it's still today one of the biggest temples in Korea. It's great. It has 18 hermitages around it. Many of those hermitages are as big as the regular temple. It holds hundreds of monks doing all kinds of very important things. That's how you imagine some of our greatest ceremonies happen there. Okay. And within that temple, in the center of the temple, is this. This is what Kajan built. The relics of Sakyamuni Buddha, it's supposedly a piece of his begging bowl and a piece of his monastic robe and some of the crystal sarya from his funeral are in that stone monument, that bell-shaped monument on a big stone platform. Gai Nui Precepts platform, the Gungang Yedan, one of the holiest places of all Korean Buddhism. Master Jajang made the rule, he said, if you want to be a Buddhist monk in this kingdom, you must come here to swear your oath. After you finish your education, after you pass the exam, you come here to this temple, and they shave your head, and put on the robe, and you stand in front of this monument and swear, I will be a Buddhist monk, I will keep the precepts. And still today, this is true. This is where most all of the Buddhist monks of Korea become a monk, standing in front of this monk since 645 AD. This is how it looks a little more of a distance. You can see the whole platform and the stone gate that the monks march through. The whole ceremony happens every spring. They have a fresh crop of monks. Do that and then at other special times as necessary. And Jajang established something unique in front of this. This is the modern uh, Joseon Dynasty recreation. This building is now like 300 years old and a great national treasure in Korea. But Jajang built the first one. It's kind of unique. It's a Buddhist temple hall like this. And then there's the altar. There's altar, but there's no Buddha statue. There's no Buddha statue on the altar. Instead, right here, there's just a window. A window, and you used to have a bamboo covering, and for worship, they would raise the covering. The window looks at this monument. So instead of a statue of Buddha, you're looking at the Buddha himself. You're looking at the relics of Buddha, that shaped monument, right out the window behind this building. So it's called the, the, the main hall with no Buddha, with no Buddha statue. Image. It's been called that all through Korean history. A unique design, Jajan just invented this, it's not something from China, uh, but then it's been copied in many other temples by now. And the temples have this with just a window right here and looking at some holy thing, something, some kind of dildo or a statue or something. So here you can see the window. Now it has glass on it, it's, it's a glass window now and looking directly at that monument a unique thing and a very holy place of Korean food. Okay. Okay. That's how it looks in the winter time. Very charming. The snow. Yeah. Now, Korea has this system of Sambol Sachal. Sambol Sachal. Uh, the, 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 the temples of the three treasures. Uh, 
This one is the first one of those. Jajak established this as the temple of the Buddha. Then Gaya Sanhainza is temple of the Dharma. We'll get to that story later in this series of lectures. And Jogesan Sangwangsa, temple of the Sangha, the monastic community. Uh, Korea is the only country that has this. Three major temples devoted to the three treasures of Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. That's right, like on temple buildings, you have this circle that is unity, the unified enlightenment, and then in the circle, three dots. You see that? There's three dots in that. That's Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. That's what that means. The three treasures of Buddhism. And this temple, Tongdosa, is the temple of Buddha. So now we go back to number six, that's up north here, at Tedesan. Notice Tedesan is the mountain where this big Tedesan, the main mountain line of Korea, comes down the east coast and suddenly it turns. It turns inland and goes to the center of South Korea and then down south, finishing at Jirizan. But Tedesan is the turning point, long in one of the holiest mountains in Korea. Before Buddhism ever showed up, it was already a very holy mountain of Korean shamanism, uh, mountain spirit, prayer, and such. Jajang went there at the end of his career, establishing Tedexan Jonanza, still a very great temple today of Jokmu. It's actually kind of on a neighboring mountain ridge. Tedexan, that's the mountain spirit painting of that temple. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's a beautiful, charming temple. Great place to visit. It's really in the middle of nowhere. It takes maybe longer to drive to this temple than any other place in Korea. But a uh, spectacular place. This is the Jokun Mogul, the actual pagoda. Uh, Jajang built a simpler pagoda than this, but it was reconstructed this way in this brick style in the medieval period, like a thousand years ago, rebuilt. And then the actual building shrine below that pagoda, again, the window that moves upward at the pagoda. That's where the relic of Buddha is. This is the sixth Jokun Mogul temple. And this is the, the hall for Master Jajang. That's Jajang himself. He's over inside this hall as the founder of this temple. And many pilgrims go there to respect him. Okay, then, near the end of his life, he's said to have climbed up on Tedexan itself, which again is the magical shamanistic mountain of Korea. If you look there closely on the very peak of the mountain, there's the stone shrine for the, the spirits of heaven and the foundation of Korea, Dangum Wangum. This October 3rd, we're having the holiday, it's Gaetanjo, national holiday, October 3rd, and that's all about how the grandson of the Lord of Heaven uh, created the first Korean kingdom, became the first king. His father was the son of the Lord of Heaven who descended to earth, etc. And that whole thing is worshipped on this shrine this coming October 3rd, and every October 3rd, as a, and right below it is that Buddhist temple. You see the temple. Jajang founded that temple. He went up there and because already a very holy place made a Buddhist temple there. There's a water source, a spring source. That is the highest Buddhist temple in South Korea. It's 1,500 meters about, uh, altitude in there. Chonobe uh, Kingdom. And it's the highest temple in the entire nation. And in Korea, higher, higher means more holy, more, more sacred. There's some the height matters. Okay, this is what happens on that every October 3rd. That's the stone shrine, very ancient stone shrine, at least 2,000 years old for worshiping Dangun and his heavenly <coughs> ancestors. And these kind of Koreans do these kind of things up there. It is spectacular. This is not Buddhism, but it's already a holy place for this. And you can see much more photos like this on my website, if you want, of this mountain and its area. This is the temple. That building actually contains the water spring, the Yongjong, the dragon well, that is one of the beginnings, beginning point of the Nakdong River. Korea's longest river that runs from the Sedexa Mountain all the way down to Busan City. And the South Coast, the longest river in South Korea, 
And that fountain is the origin of that river and the, the very humble temple that still remains way up there. Mountain hikers use it a lot as a stopping place. It's famous for shamanism, uh, old Korean shamanism up here on Moonsu Ball. The Moonsu is, remember, the Bodhisattva Wisdom. Bodhisattva Wisdom Peak, Moonsu Ball, is there as uh, the secondary peak. And shamans, these people you see there are Korean shamans up there worshiping 1,500 meters high, even in the winter, whatever, worshiping, praying to the Sanjin, to the mountain spirit, trying to get that power up there. Still today, very active place. And Buddhist monks come up there too, because Jajan said, Jajan reported to his disciples that he discovered the mother of Buddha is the mountain spirit, the Sanshin, mountain spirit, mountain god. Uh, every mountain in Korea has a mountain spirit. He said, I found a female mountain spirit that, who's the mother of Mutsubosa, the mother of the Bodhisattva of wisdom. This is really a Korean thing. This is mixing together Korean shamanism, folklore, the Sanjin belief, mixing it together with Buddhism. Because in Buddhism, in actual Buddhism, Bodhisattvas don't have mothers. There's no such thing. Uh, bodhisattvas do not have a mother and a father. The original Sakyamuni Buddha, he did, of course, he's a human being, but bodhisattvas as deities, of course, they don't have mothers and fathers. Uh, but Jagai made this up in order to mix together Korean traditional beliefs with Buddhism and make it acceptable to Korean people. To help make Buddhism as a Korean thing, and monks still worship the mother of Munzubo's out up on this peak. Uh, he died in uh, 658, passed in their run. He was 68 years old. He accomplished so much. By the time he died, Wong Yo and Wisan were big Buddha, young Buddhist superstars of the next generation. And that's the topic of my next lecture. Uh, what they accomplished uh, is that he died as Buddhist master of the nation. Yeah, there's a whole myth uh, about death here. Um, this is a, a, a strange one. Uh, Munsu Bosal appearing again, but they not being recognized. Now, summary of legacy simply, we look to establish these Jokyo Bogu temples. Five out of the six still exist. Wang Yongsa is gone. But the other five still exist and still have the pagodas or relics or something there, still actively worship major places of Korean Buddhism and granting Buddhist names to the mountains. Now, he consecrated the mountains of Shilla's east coast in this way, sacralizing all of Korea as a holy land, equivalent in Buddhist sacredness to China and India, but with a unique Korean flavor. Understand the psychology of this here, what this really means. Uh, when Buddhism came to China, it was from India. China was more developed, more advanced civilization than India, higher technological development. And Chinese are very proud people. If you, they're proud of themselves, proud of their culture, proud of their country. If you ever talk to a Chinese person, you will discover this. Uh, they're very self-confident, they think a lot. But they got this new religion from India, and it came into China, and it was fascinating. They wanted to do it, but there was a problem. It's a foreign religion. So far, it's coming from India, and they're less developed than us. It has to be, we are Chinese. We have our own philosophy. We have our own belief. And it's foreign religion. So the way they overcame that is they made holy Buddhist mountains in China, where the Bodhisattvas would live. India is the land of the Buddha. Sure, the Buddha was born there. The Buddha spirit is in India. But the major bodhisattvas, four major bodhisattvas, compassion, wisdom, benevolent action, and salvation, they live in China. They got mountains where they are their residence in China. So China is equal to India as a holy land, then, as a Buddhist holy land. Then Chinese people can believe in Buddhism. Because China is equal. China is a holy land. Now, Jajang was just doing the same thing for Korea. The same thing. 
He went to the holy place of the Bodhisattva wisdom, and he came back to Korea, and he discovered the same mountains. He's also here. He's also living here. Let's imagine his main residence is Wu Tai Shan, China. He has a summer house. He's got a vacation house in Korea. Odesan Mountain, the same kind of mountain. Jajang established this and put in the other holy shrines, planting the Buddha directly into the mountain, therefore making Korea a holy land equal to China, which is equal to India, so that Koreans could adopt Buddhism and they don't feel inferior. They don't have to feel like, oh, this is a foreign religion. Why? Well, you know, it's not really Korean. Now, Korea becomes a holy land. Then it could be truly a Korean religion with no sense of shame or inferiority. Other places, the other bodhisattvas, like bodhisattva of compassion, were found in other places. I'll mention that next time. One such incident discovered that homes for them were discovered at other holy places in Korea, so that all the bodhisattvas uh, have a secondary residence here in Korea, education home, like that. So, uh, Queen Sanja, all the things that she did of giving Jajang authorization. So really, uh, he's the founder, what we say, the Sangha, Sangha or Sangha in Sanskrit, the monastic community, community of monks and the lay people, people like you, the lay believers participate in Buddhism and the monks and the temple ground together, the monastic community. Jaja is the founder. Really set the basis, set the rules, set the standards, and started it and still regarded as that. Today, he is the one great master who created the monastic community of Korea and its maintenance. Okay. And he advised that 71 meter pagoda that they're talking about rebuilding in Gyeongju, and they already rebuilt kind of a modern version of it in the tourist area. These, uh, again, just to review, these are the ones with their dates, the Jokmil Bogum uh, temples. Number one is lost, the other ones still remain in our primary to pilgrimage tourism sites and such, and these others, uh, other Korean temples that now claim, Yongnubogum said, that somebody else brought a relic of Buddha to Korea at some later century and establishes all of these uh, claim that some of them more believable than others. Uh, okay, and then uh, 34 temples claim that Jajang founded them. We don't a lot of these things we don't know for sure, but it is said. But every temple loves to claim that some really famous master monk in history founded it a long time ago. Uh, some of these we have evidence for and some not. Uh, Sodaksan, those are the ones. And also even Tewatan uh, uh, Mahoksa, one of our UNESCO World Heritage Site, says that Jajar founded it, but it was at that time in the Bekche Kingdom, the enemy rival Bekche Kingdom. So how could Jajar have founded that temple? We don't know. Doesn't really make sense, but they say, and these very famous temples, most of them are in the Shilla Kingdom area, also Jajang founded. And for more information about these temples and these places and the holy mountains of the day, please take a look. My thousand page website about uh, mainly about holy mountains of Korea, my main topic, sacred mountains. Um, all that more information is there. Thank you very much. Questions? We're open for questions. Any follow up? Any comments? Mountain spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Is there some special reason why do you are focusing on the Hanshin? Oh yeah, well, that's been my main focus of research for more than 30 years. The Sanshin, the uh, mountain spirit of Korea. Uh, it's a very central, if you look at my website, you see hundreds of examples of statues and paintings all over Korea of the mountain spirit. It connects together ancient Korean shamanism and the idea of Dangun, the first king of, per, of the first kingdom of Korea, which we're celebrating on October 3rd, and the uh, uh, Buddhism and Confucianism and Taoism uh, all connected together through the Sanshin as kind of a central focal point for all those things that meet each other in Korean culture. I published a book about the Sanjin in 1999, which was the first book about Sanjin uh, in any language. They translated, it became Book of the Year by the Korean government for its pioneering aspect, and they translated it into Korean. It's still on sale in bookstores in Korean version. Um, it's still the main book in the Korean language about that. But it, it's a major, major part of Korean culture. Very important. Yeah, on my website is called that. It's Sanshin.org because Sanshin.com was already taken. Uh, so Sanshin, also in Japanese, Sanshin is the name of a musical instrument, kind of a lute. And so there are many websites devoted to the Japanese Sanshin, to that musical thing. They already sold Sanshin.com in every possible combination and .net. But I did get Sanjin.org. I am not an organization. Uh, but it's what we got. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a work out. So, yeah, that's been my main fascination here in Korea. That's what's kept me here all these years. This is a small little country, you know, it's a tiny little place. Uh, South, if you're American or you know about America, South Korea is the size of Indiana. South Korea is the same size as Indiana. It's a little smaller than the lower region of Michigan. It's a tiny little place in the country, but there's like 10,000 shrines of the Sanjin, 10,000 mountain spirit shrines spread out throughout this nation. And they all have paintings and statues, and then the weird, the paintings are all different, always unique, never the same, which fascinates me. I love finding new ones. Photographs, cataloging. You know, Buddha statues. Buddha statues, Buddha statues are mostly the same. Temple to temple to temple, pretty much the same. Only a few unique ones. They have to. There are rules for making a Buddha statue. The monks have to follow the rules. For Sanjin, for the mountain spirit, there's no rules. There's no rules. The artist can do what he wants to do. And in ten thousand places around Korea, you have unique. Unique and amazing thing. Check my website and look through a variety of some, uh, amazing research that I'm still not done. Questions? Jajan? Buddhism? It's very focalized. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the holy city for three different religions, and they're willing to kill each other and pretty much endlessly trying to control Jerusalem. Uh, Buddhism, not quite like that. They're more peaceful about it, definitely. Buddhism is spread out. There's four or five major holy sites in India. 
one of them actually is in Nepal now, you know, Buddha's birthplace, and they pretty much kind of share the holy Buddhism. But then as Buddhism traveled, they made caves. They carved cave temples and set up through Central Asia and then to China, and they kind of had a sense of making themselves a holy land, kind of like how the Catholic Church for in the Church of like to Rome, and Rome became a holy city of the Catholic Church, secondarily to Jerusalem very important the public, and like that. And Chinese Buddhism developed different, as I say, from Indian Buddhism. It became a separate thing. Indian Buddhism is more authentic to, uh, like, Southeast Asia, the Theravada Buddhism thing. But China really kind of made it different, made it its own thing. Um, and my series of lectures will kind of follow how that happened over here. But then uh, China definitely had a sense of making itself a different but kind of equal holy land of Buddhism. And, there, and, China, and it involves really just national pride. And these people are very proud of themselves. Our nation has to be equal to any other land, or else we can't do your religion. I guess Chinese Christians feel differently than that. But they do. Uh, Korean Christians, on the other you can see that phenomenon very much. They're trying to make like Korea, the new Jerusalem of Christianity. A lot of Korean ministers at these megachurches uh, claim every single Sunday, they claim Jesus is going to return here to Korea. He'll be, he'll be re reborn here in Korea when he comes. Korea is going to be the new Israel. Uh, they're very strong, by like, uh, the sense of a holy man. In America, we did that. You've heard of the Mormon church. In America, the LDS, Later Day Saints, the Mormons in Utah State, they did that. They claimed that Jesus came to America after his crucifixion. He appeared in America, teach to the Native Americans, and established America as the new Israel. And still today, they believe that in Utah, that's the, the new center of, of Jesus. People do this all over the world. This is part of the religion, and spreading the idea of holy land. Place to our community. Mm. So, yeah. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for coming. Next time, we're going to talk about Wang Yo and Wisai, the superstars of the late 6th century that everybody still remembers and talks about, and very great dramatic stories about them as brother monks together, what they accomplished to really make Korean Buddhism. Oh, really? Okay, thank you very much.